Thank you to all of you for joining. This is really a wonderful day we've been looking forward to for a long time. This is a long-term project. Um, and I'm really happy to invite our hosts here, Adrienne Gret Regeme and uh, her two colleagues, Michael van Bruegel and uh, our close colleague from some time now. Uh, we'll get to the uh, what, Nicholas Salio. So I'm gonna just give a very briefest of introductions because I'm really keen, we, as we know, we usually have a half an hour presentation and a half an hour for cross-platform exchange that will be moderated through the chat. So if you have a question at any time, please go ahead and post it. And when it comes time for the discussion, we'll be going through one by one and asking you to then at that moment, when your question comes up, unmute and turn on your camera and please ask it and we'll pin you. That way we get you on video as well. So you see it's all being assiduously documented by the team here. Many thanks to Nirali for helping to coordinate as we jump in here. So, um, I thought it would be nice to just start briefly because we have so much good information on the website just to refer to some of the wealth of data that's being shared here. Of course, we're here today for the resilient blue green infrastructures presentation and we're really excited to get caught up on what's been happening with you guys in the past months. This is summarized here. I love this phrase uh, that communities rely on local waterways and green areas to meet basic needs for food and water, sanitation and recreational space, while blue and green infrastructures are increasingly being recognized as necessary strategies to relieve infrastructures. In fact, they often play second fiddle to hard infrastructure and that type of thing. So this is really exciting to see this so beautifully framed. The presenters here, as are listed here, this is so nice. If you want to go, you can click on each one of these. Professor Dr. Adrian Gret Regeme is the principal investigator and professor at the Chair of Planning, Landscape, and Urban Systems at the Institute for Spatial and Landscape Development at ETHA. This is a neighbor to my home chair, of Professor Christoph Giro, and our colleagues up there. It's such a wonderful cohort to be back on campus now and spending time with some of you guys there. So um, it's nice if you click out on this, you'll see later one of the cool things I learned reading Adrian's uh, rather more complete uh, CV is that she won both the silver medal for her master's and then almost 10 years later for her PhD. That's so fascinating, I'm not surprised. But we got overachievers here in well representation, <laughs> so fantastic. And um, of course, one of the things I, I have to mention, and I won't pull it up here now, but you know that uh, Adrian is also uh, on the steering committee for the FCL Global and the Zurich Hub. And uh, that steering committee will be meeting tomorrow with the cohort, both in Singapore and uh, Zurich. So that'll be great. And the thing that she's also taken an additional responsibility with is the creation of the engagement platform. So she's the coordinator lead of this initiative within the FCL Global. So similarly, Michael Van Bruegel has a very fantastic uh, background coming from Wageningen, so there's a lot of overlap and I think a lot of our cohort here. Um, he's associate professor, received his M Master of Science in Forestry and Nature Management, and his PhD in 2007 from Wageningen. So his work here is, of course, in relation to his being co-investigator and associate professor through the Yale and U.S. College. And Nicholas, Dr. Nicholas Stelio, is a module coordinator, so we're working with him on a regular basis with all of this wonderful material. And uh, I trust that you guys will take it from here. I give the platform to you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Matthew. I think I'll try to share my screen now. OK, can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> Yes, yes. Good. okay super because i can't see you so welcome everybody it's nice to see a few familiar faces and thanks for giving the platform today to talk a little bit about what we understand as resilient and how can we foster cities to become resilient towards the changes we're expecting and as you can see here we're focusing on these blue and green infrastructure i'll get back a little bit more specifically about what they are. You see here a mega city, a mega city which provides amazing opportunities. They allow economic of, economies of scale, but on the other hand, it's also a large city, which when you look at it, it's increasingly vulnerable to climate change, but also an increasing migration of people 
And all these people under these changes are highly dependent on the functioning of what you see here as a blue infrastructure, this river here for transportation, but also, for example, for the cooling of the city, as well as if you look a little bit in depth in this picture, you see these green areas, this green infrastructure for, for example, water regulation when it rains a lot, but also for cooling, microclimate regulation, or for the clean air, or also, of course, for recreation. The UN International Strategy for Disaster Reduction has recently concluded that cities are increasingly vulnerable to global environmental change. This can be drought, but also flooding here, can be heat stress, extreme rainfall events, and of course, other natural catastrophes. For example, when they're hit by a natural disaster, these urban areas compared to rural areas, they tend to really suffer greater fatalities. You can imagine all these people here and economic losses. Because people are concentrated in buildings, there's a lot of services and assets, and also all these tightly interconnected infrastructures. And this high concentration and connectivity of this infrastructure in urban areas and even so in such very complex mega cities, really put these systems at the risk of cascading system failures. So the big question today is a little bit, how can we design such cities to become more resilient to these changes? When I talk today about resilience, it's important that I don't, uh, a lot of people, mix it up to the concept of sustainability. Let me take an example. When, for example, we try to achieve something efficient through huge investments, for example, in energy or water or food delivery systems, there are some negative externalities of every one of those systems which compromise the long-term resilience. And also it generates some feedback loops of undesired resilience. For example, when these water systems I was talking before about become energy intense because you want to have them very efficient, this compromises sustainability and is not considered as a resilient system, a resilient energy system. So I really like this, um, this graph of Tom Elmquist which shows that when we talk about resilience, we explicitly need to consider transformation. It's a dynamic resilience. It's a resilience which allows all the functions of the system to continue over time under these changes to produce the necessary services we want in the future. So you can see here this line, this blue line, this is a pathway. And along you see the resilient and you see that it can change depending on the buffering capacity of that system, but it's not something static. And a lot of time we think about a system as a very statically resilient against the change. We build, for example, a dike, but of course the dike needs then continuously to be put, to be increased in size because the system around it changes. What I want to say here is that we really need to consider this resilience as something dynamic along a transformation pathway, as you can see here. And we're going to try to consider this dynamic changes using as a buffering unit and as a functioning unit, the blue and green infrastructures I showed before. When I talk about blue and green infrastructure, I talk a lot about what has been called ecosystem services, but nowadays also it's called nature contribution to people in the EPES, um, in the EPES uh, uh, groups. And you can see what they include. They include, for example, food production, but also carbon sequestration, especially when we talk about nature contribution to people where people become as a, as a main, uh, element of these beneficiaries. We talk about mental health or recreation. We also talk about air purification 
and as I said before, for example, microclimate cooling. We just quantified such services, and I just would like to show you the importance of them, for example, in a mega city like Singapore. And you can see the, the value of all this natural capital for humans. This was the result of a three year project we were able to conduct in Singapore, trying to value, quantify and value the services provided by the natural capital in Singapore. And you can see that approximately 1.9 million dollars is produced just by capturing of carbon in the green and blue structures. We also see that this green and blue infrastructure can provide air temperature reduction of 3.6 degrees. And what is also nice is that people are also willing to pay amount, uh, almost $4 a month for 20% for air purification. We see that the coastal line, the protection of the coastline through the mangroves are highly important. And we also see that this vegetation can reduce soil erosion. We also see that we can have a, a, a re retainment of the rainfall during heavy storm. And what I said before with the nature contribution to people, we see that this connection to nature is also very important for reducing depression, stress and anxiety. In Singapore, there's even hospitals which are starting to be designed for having these green infrastructures in the, the design itself to be able to reduce also uh, the costs, the health costs. And you also see that there is a part which is very uh, based on the local beneficiaries, which is related to spiritual, for example, contemplation. Talking about this resilience, the idea is to identify what in these resilient system is really the key characteristics which is necessary to be supported to allow this system to evolve while still being resilient. And it's not a new thought. When we look already in the whole ecology, we saw already, for example, all the studies done by Tillman, here just an example of 2001, you can see this very nice relationship between high biodiversity and a resistance or a resilience to drought. Here, you can see that a very low plant species richness, so a very small biodiversity amount of different plants leads to a very strong decrease in biomass production compared to a high plant richness, which then increases the drought resistance here. Also because these plants, they have other fitness and are able to absorb these shocks differently. What is interesting is that we see a very similar system when we look at, uh, for example, in a city here, it's not in a city, it's in a mountain areas, but we see that if we, if we look at a system where we also take humans into account, we see a very similar pattern. We see that it's important to have different actors with different capabilities. And if we have these different actors under all kinds of changes, they are better able to provide ecosystem services and to have these ecosystem services provided by the system under different pressure and pulses, for example, climate change or socioeconomic changes. So a very similar graph you can see on the left side can be, can be seen in a social ecological system. And this is exactly what we're trying to identify by designing these resilient city is to try to understand what are the main characteristics of these systems to be able to buffer against these changes in a dynamic manner. To do so, we are trying to take a very participatory approach, which it's based on a science design loop. Why a loop? Because we have certain designs which we need to understand how good they buffer against these changes. And how do we need to change these designs to continuously be able to buffer against climate change and socioeconomic changes? Looking at this process, we see here on one side the blue 
threat and the red threat. The blue is the design and the red is the science. And you see that we have a very important to design it. We need a, a, to have this um, iteration between science and design to be able to, un to understand how the system is functioning under different pressure and pulses, and also how the system is anchored in a context. And you see here the gray areas are these participation and the importance of the participation along the process of designing such cities. You see that especially here, the science and design loop need to be anchored in a specific landscape with specific norms, value, expectation of what this city needs to provide in the long term. And I'm going in the next slides, I'm going to try to illustrate how you can operationalize such a science design loop in a participatory manner to be able to build such resilient and sustainable city. As the basis for communication, we will use points. Why points? Because points allow us to communicate between the scientists and the designer. You can see here what I mean at a point. It's a point in space which can be assessed, for example, with a LiDAR scanner and which allows us on the one side to modify the aesthetic of a certain landscape. On the other hand, to identify and to calculate how this aesthetic, how this change is really providing different, for example, ecosystem services and how these ecosystem services are going to be able to be produced under different design and under changes in um, climate and socio-ecological uh, and economic boundary conditions. How do we take that data for the design? This is the work the landscape architects in our a project are conducting here the work especially of Philip Urech who is part of our project where we take first a uh, geometric information out of the landscape here with a scanner as you can see on the left side which allows us to deconstruct and manipulate these landscape because we want to design the city and to understand how these design are really resilient against these changes. These designs can be decomposed and manipulated in different elements. It can be the vegetation, the buildings, but also the topology, the 3D, uh, the 3D area of the system. And we can then design here different systems, which can be informed by the model in terms of how well does this system function? What are the services providing under different conditions. And this last step is, of course, done in a modeling uh, environment where we use this design as an input to understand how this design is going to function and what are the services provided by this design under these changes. You can see here, for example, again, Singapore under different designs using this point cloud technology. And this will then be informed by models which will calculate, for example, the microclimate regulation or, for example, the, um, the uh, cooling effect or food production, etc. We can calculate under these designs, these new services, for example, in the NATCAP tool we've been developed, which I'm not going to show today because I would like to focus on the science design loop. So I'm going to take you to Jakarta, where we have conducted one of the first science design loop we've done, which is uh, the basic to build up uh, the new project we have in FCL Global, which is in Antananarivo. And the project was uh, conducted under the PI of um, Christophe Giraud. Uh, and the idea was, to try to understand what kind of functioning structure we could provide in this mega city. You can see it here with all these so-called campoons. These are uh, poor, uh, poor areas which are very densely uh, populated 
and are prone to the flooding of the Chilimung River you can see here in this area. And the government at that time, and you will see also what it has implemented, wants to implement a re so-called revitalization of this river. But what they call a revitalization is really to increase the functionality of the water transport capacity in this area and not really looking at all the other services these areas provide. And their vision is really to produce something like in Singapore, where the river is put into a culvert that taking away the water, removing the flood, but of course also changing the social ecological system drastically so that the living these, these areas cannot be used at the same um, way as they've been used until now and also changing a lot the land price leading to a situation as we've seen in Singapore which are very high quality apartments here but of course these situations these villages which at the moment function as, a, as an own village get drastically changed. So the idea was really over the different scales to try to understand what would be the optimal design at the site, which under all the boundary condition of the catchment scale and the corridor scale would provide a functioning system, which not only is good for water regulation, but also provides some other services demanded by the population. And I will go through these different scales to illustrate how this science design loop has functioned. As I said, we really first wanted to understand what is the landscape and what kind of services does this landscape have to provide for the people first. As you remember this, um, uh, the participatory design science loop really anchors itself in the landscape, in the system itself and tries to first identify what are the needs of the people related to this green and blue infrastructure so that it could really provide in the long term the services demanded by the next generation under these pressure impulses. And you can see here that we did this using choice experiment. There's different ways. You could also do scenario building. You can do visioning exercises, et cetera, to identify what are the needs and the visions of the local people in these area regarding the blue and green infrastructure. Based on that, we then tried to understand what are the, at the catchment scale, large changes which are going to happen depending on, for example, planning, spatial planning, what is expected. And you can see here, depending on the scenarios, that we have a change up to 20% of water discharge, which is going to be reflected at the site in terms of the change in the water flow and also the services provided. So an intervention at the site scale needs to understand what's going on at the large scale. So that was the first small iteration between science and design here to understand what's going on at the largest scale. Here at the corridor scale, we also tried to identify, do we need to have certain interventions such as dams, for example, to stop what is going on at, the, uh, at this large scale, depending on these land use change and these spatial planning uh, changes going on at the scale. And how does these changes, you can see here, reflect then in flooding in the, at the site and also in the contaminant simulation here at the site. You can see, depending on these scenarios we had at the catchment scale, you can see how this reflects then down at the local scale, at the site scale, using intervention scales at the corridor scale. And this again, in a very iterative loop, we defined and designed different scenarios here uh, at that sale scale. At the site scale, you can see here the final product after several iteration, which was done again with this LIDAR technique, where the architects also added, removed certain elements in the landscape. And again, we were able to calculate 
the effect of these small scale design on the flooding, the velocity of the water, and also the hazards to the humans, because of course, these are disservices the people were not interested to have. In the next small movie, this shows a little bit the entire process. And you can see here the whole corridor area. And I'm just, and you can see the, the LIDAR information at these different scales. You see the bird eye view at all these three scales. And here we exploited then the, the feedback between science and design using these different models. You can see here the results of the models. And you can see here again, this large scale intervention scale. And we tested this repeatedly, all the different designs and looked at the flood extents, the velocity, the depths. What is interesting at the end, you can really use this leader, LIDAR data to develop a physical model to communicate the results. Unfortunately, you can see here the results which really happened. Um, this, our uh, project in that sense was taken up by Del Torres, but the company uh, of, uh, and the water offices in Jakarta decided to create what they really wanted to do. And you can see the consequence here a few years later, uh, after they had built this, uh, you can see the consequence of the flooding uh, using what they expected uh, to use by taking the water away. Of course, it could not buffer. It was not dynamic enough to be able to buffer the changes which happened then a few years later. So the same way of thinking, what are the characteristics of the system we need to keep to be able to buffer these dynamic changes is going to be applied in the floodplains of Antananarivo in this next project. You can see here um, one of these, uh, I forgot to end, Antananarivo, which is wrong here, but you can see here uh, actually the current, the actual situation and the issues we're facing, which is not exactly the same than what we faced in uh, Jakarta. We have much more to do we, here with the change in terrain and the change in terrain and the, the movement of the soil to uh, produce different services such as bricks decreases the possibility here for food production and changes the services in such a way that with the time neither bricks nor rice produce, production can be built and these areas are changed are filled up by soil which is then used for building and thus change the whole flooding capacity of this plain which provided that many uh, services. Just to show where we are at in this project we're not that far yet we have done a first site visit. We have taken also the LIDAR data. Again, Philip has worked here on it. I will try to show um, a little bit how this looks like. Uh, these point data you can see here. And you can see that this is not just only uh, extremely interesting information in terms of the land use in 2D, but it provides these 3D changes of the landscape at a very high resolution information, which is then going to be used here again in the science design loop. I hope that I can get back here. Uh, here we go. So these are first ideas of design of these landscapes, and they're again going to be used in this science design loop, which we have not started yet. So we are here at this 
part of the project. And we can expect here that we will have these informed design at the end of next year to be able to validate them also with the stakeholders in the system and think about the implementation step of such a system. If it's done well, we hope that by having the participatory approach along the way that we will get an open door here for some possibilities for implementation of such things. To finalize, I would like just to give a short summary of three elements I think are key, what we learned also from the different case studies we have for designing such resilient and adaptive cities. I think the first thing is that these uh, designs need to be embedded across scales. We need to increase the credibility when we have different stakeholders which manage the landscape at these uh, different scale. And this will also help us really foster some adaptive solution under different government and managing solutions. The second thing is we really need to link these patterns and process, this science and design loop, and not only do this in, uh, in our world of scientists, but really encourage here evaluation process, encourage public participation to also have the people engaged and become steward of these informed design. And at the end, I think the use of these point cloud technologies were really are, have been really useful to link design and science and to have a new communication tool and to allow really communication across the disciplines. And also at the end, I would say most importantly also to negotiate what are the goals of the development, for whom are we developing and what kind of expectations are, have we and can we address based on these new designs and based on the wishes and the expectations from the local uh, population. So I'm going to stop the presentation and I'm looking forward for any kinds of questions. Thank you kindly. This is really exciting to see the work that you've been developing now. Is there anyone, we don't have any uh, chat questions yet. Is there anyone who'd like to raise a hand or even jump in with a question? I would say maybe just to uh, say from my side, I, I was curious if maybe you would clarify just a little bit when you say catchment, I suppose at first that you mean like a watershed, but maybe you mean more political boundaries or maybe it's a combination. Could you clarify when you say catchment? <laughs> uh, in the Jakarta, it was really a physical catchment area. Uh, of course, it's often a catchment is often linked to uh, a certain administrative boundary, but that's not always the case. For example, in Switzerland, we have certain catchment area where you have different communities. And of course, if you want to manage such systems, it would be good to have it across boundary conditions, administrative boundary condition, because it's a functional management. And that's, it becomes very important to have the, the, the administrative boundary not playing too much a role for the management of such areas. Thank you, that sounds clear. There is a question coming from Stephen, it looks like. Hey, well, thank you again, Adrian. I, I, I just found it sort of really, really wonderful. And I, as I said in the chat, I, I have a question, but a kind of niggle, and I, I haven't quite formed it. But, but I think this is, I'm, we're also very interested in the relationship between science and design. And we have a similar diagrams, but our diagrams tend to be more messy. And I'm, I'm, I'm a bit worried about the linearity of it. And as an architect, um, I often find, for example, that the science will change the need. So the whole process can be, up, can be turned upside down by new insight from science or the production of a very beautiful, highly calibrated point cloud model could, can, can profoundly change the parameters of the project. It could change the stakeholders it could exclude some and include others. In other words, the whole landscape could change depending on how articulate uh, the science is. And because your science is so articulate, including the models, um, I think it changes the, the, the ground rules. And I would be very interested to think, get your reaction on, 
on that maybe in relation to Jakarta, but but what what might be happening in your in your planning? Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important point you raised. The question is always when when do we start doing the yeah. the process? Uh, it's true. I mean, just what you say is 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 very interesting. We had a very different ideas going into Antananarivo on what we wanted to do. To do, we thought it's really going to be about the nexus between flood and food. So we thought, oh, let's design a flood landscape which provides food. Mm. What we realized is what was much more interesting was this land use change which is happening, where people are digging the soil, providing a trap. It's a kind of a trap because you you dig the soil to create to create bricks. With the time, the whole carbon is exported. Kind of, you cannot provide any food anymore, and it becomes yeah. such a trap that. The only way to really use the land afterwards is to fill it up again and to build something on top of it. Mm -hmm. And while we were really thinking about something different, it's true that just through going into the site, thinking about the design already changed the problem. So I absolutely agree. I yeah. think the, the showing that we have this problem and then the science design loop and then the implementation, I think this linearity is... Uh, too easy uh, often, but I have to say that practically, uh, you you are often then. Um, it, it would be nice to be able to go back and to do all the problem framing. I think um, it, it has to to be in different levels probably of complexity that you go there and you think about design in a very loose way, but as soon as you really start to um, uh, to, to do the design and the science loop, you have to have a good framing of the problem. Otherwise, I think you, you will always be at a very, very shallow way of working. But it's yeah. true that it would have been probably also this uh, very linear thing should show that in the problem framing, when you have scientists and designers working together, that it's already kind of a science design loop in that sense, but it's more you're just discussing the problem, but you're not hands on doing the design and the loop. So that's maybe yes, yes. It, it is there in the first part, but I, I, it's true. It's it's also this science design loop, which should all, it also happens there in the problem framing. It has the blue and the green, the, the blue and yeah. the red are the same price, but it's true. It's it looks very linear. And I agree. I think it's uh, it's very important. Thanks. Super. Marcia, would you like to go ahead, please? You're we muted. can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted at the moment. <laughs> Sorry. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. I am pretty pretty new here. To this this project is very new to me, and um, I I. I already worked at the ERL in the past with Professor Schull, uh, but I didn't know this project. So I, first of all, I'd like to say it's really good. I'm really impressed with it. And I was just thinking the same thing as Stephen was saying about this iterative uh, process, how important it is, and how all the whole reframing of the situation. Uh, for example, in this Jakarta project, we did you you developed a, a wonderful work, and at the end it wasn't applied. No? So, um, how do you see this? What went wrong? What could you have done differently? Mm -hmm. no? Because we try to to analyze the situation within this social political context as well, didn't you? It's a it's a difficult question. I have no I have no full answer to what uh, what what can we do. I think it's um, the we were not asked to do that. I think this is the first thing. So you come into a system which already has engineers and expectations and a certain political 
um, way of, of doing things. And um, you intervene in a system which has certain rules. And the question is, can you break what is what the rules of the, of the development is? How do you do that as a group of scientists? Of course, it, it was quite a big project, even with the population. I mean, the population was involved in the project and yeah. the population would have much more supported our project, but they didn't have a stake neither in this whole transformation. And it, it really depends a little bit also on the political process, which is at, at the basis. So I have to say, we're trying with Nicola, maybe Nicola, you want to add something here, but we're really trying uh, at the moment to have such a stakeholder platform with more political, responsible people in, um, in, uh, in Antananarivo. And I think we also selected the case study area, which was at a point in time where there was still not too much stakes going on. The Tilimu River was already at one of the big, uh, uh, big target. The, uh, the, the people in the offices, in the, the water offices had. We are selecting now a case study where it's not too much in the, uh, at the basis where we can really hope that we're early enough to prepare a model case which can be used and also applied to other areas. But maybe Nicola, you want to add something here? Yeah, just a little bit more details, but I, I totally agree with what you said before. It's what we are trying now to do uh, as a learning process from uh, the Jakarta case to Antananarivo is really to engage uh, much more from the beginning with decision makers, uh, because we really realize it's absolutely key to add them on board as early as possible. And I'm saying in that sense, we are uh, having some good signals in Antananarivo as uh, we have, uh, we are building a platform together with the Ministry of Landscape Planning in Antananarivo and we get uh, main institutions about the flood management. We'll have also the, the mayors of the main municipalities that are in the case study area. So really, really from the start, we're having uh, people that will take the decision at the end anyway. Uh, and I think in Jakarta, that was an amazing work on the participatory process to really engage with the local population, the, all the inhabitants of the Kampung that Adrian presented. Um, but the engagement with decision makers was unfortunately done a bit later. And so they had to kind of accept all the work that has been done a bit late, so they could not really appropriate the whole process of design. And at the end, then they defaulted on the, the, the idea they had before. Uh, so just to give a, a little bit more detail, but basically Adrian said, uh, what, what, what was the main learning about trying to get those decision maker on board? Great, thank you. I think we have a question from Andreas. Please go ahead. Yeah, I have just one question about regarding the process, but at the beginning. So I have, was involved in several projects in Switzerland where you also had uh, bigger plannings in cities and the regional. But what I always thought was lacking was this collection of information. So this uh, process of getting informed about uh, all the knowledge that's available and uh, getting informed about the situation there, uh, how the processes are. And I think that's a process that's a bit lacking. So most time it takes a long time, it also involves the people that are living there. So like traditionally getting the knowledge from the elderly. So all this process, how are you tackling it? How do you then collect it and make the information available to everybody? So also it's, not only the researchers, but also the, the designers that then have to work with and establish this um, common base. Um, uh, thanks for this question. I think it goes also a little bit with what we said before. I, I think uh, we are uh, now in Antananarivo. We had this full first field trip. We have a very good group of people who are, so we have these tandem with the people from there. So we have a PhD student here, a PhD student there, a postdoc here, a postdoc there. So we have these tandem working together. And I have to say the COVID situation, well, it had been quite difficult for us, it provided a huge chance for the local group to become very active. 
And I think we, as you, as you saw, I mean, we went into it, we had written that proposal and we changed it quite drastically already now after the third field visit, exactly because this happened. They, we went there into a system with our ideas and it was really quite different than what we had expected. And, uh, and I think, I mean, we've, in Switzerland, we've done visioning workshops, et cetera, to try to, to get these ideas first. In that, in that area, we've done now interviews and we have local people who are really participating, who are, who are making kind of the work in the case study area with us. Uh, it's one way to do it. And as Nicola said, there is a big stakeholder platform. So a kind of a decision and arena, which we set up as a first thing um, with a, local people uh from different from different areas so yeah while, while it's um i think it's always going to be challenging and it's the question is that a better way or maybe if anyone has a better idea how to do that we would be very interested to hear but at the moment that's how we anchor our work into trying to uh, um, use local people use interviews anchor it there and be open to change the project I think that's the, that's the big uh, issue, which is usually in science very difficult. And I think FCL provided a really nice uh, possibility to do that because it, we are not bound to exactly the proposal we had been writing while we have written what we wanted to do in general terms. The, the, the really the focus of what we're doing is quite flexible. And this is in different project that's often not possible and here was i think this is really we should we should take that opportunity to be able to do that thank you wonderful any other particular questions now we're coming pretty close to the end of our hour and i have the feeling like i should be a little bit provoking here to hear from michael because you've been so quiet but you're a major part of this project can i just ask you to say a couple of words maybe even i could frame it just a bit the last two questions we had, and, and Adrian, you spoke to them really clearly. It's the challenge, of course, we can't probably ever expect to be uh, comprehensive in any sort of assessment we make. We can only try to be representative somehow. So I was wondering if in your uh, experience with this project, I'm thinking of many public participation projects have been involved in there's Even you try your best, you've, depending on the situation, you might have frustration from the community that they don't, you know, Get to contribute the way they feel and so forth. So there's one thing about a clear structure where you kind of let people know in advance, here's the process and here are the moments you can intervene and then they don't get disappointed. Or like you say, you're more flexible, but in the end, this is probably a case by case basis. Can you say something maybe about uh, your experience, especially dealing with the, the watershed as this kind of armature for these exchanges? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what your your question is. I uh, sharing my experience, but uh, I, I could I didn't catch it very well. Well, really, I want to just more or less open the floor to you to if you have reflections about experiences you've had with public participation, um, whether in the context of this project or other, because um, it's difficult. Oh. I'm just thinking, for example, if you have an economist on the team, then someone might say there's this macroeconomic method that we use called PESTEL. That means we assess politics, economics, sociology, technology, environment, and law. And then we just make a calendar for each one of those subjects through the project. And that's a basis for shared exchange about them with specialists. This kind of a structure, uh, right, of uh, priorities. Um, I, have, I have not um, a great deal of experience with um, working with designers and, and, and models, et cetera, start with not. I do have a bit of an experience uh, way back from my time in, in, uh, when I was in Panama, which we, we looked at uh, ecosystem services from watersheds. And actually similar to this project, what um, uh, it, it, part of the collaborations was uh, between um, ecologists, plant forest ecologists and um, hydrologists. We were actually in that particular project, we were also a small part. Uh, hydrology was the major focus of the project. Uh, there were three very different group of hydrologists. So one interesting thing, uh, so it was more in science science uh, or in science modeling uh, collaboration, I have to say. Um, one interesting, uh, what I find personally interesting is to notice how different groups 
of scientists a very different culture of working and, 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 and uh, discussing among them. I felt I, I, I learned that ecologists are very friendly, collaborative people <laughs> in relative terms. Uh, hydrologists have very strong opinions. That was a good tool. But it was, um, I found in my experience, and I have, I'm starting to feel that in, in this project as well. It, uh, I think it's always a major challenge when you try to link uh, science, specifically, at least uh, the kind of science I'm doing, which is normally quite. Uh, detailed, focused on mechanisms, on um, that, to combine it with, um, for example, modeling or uh, it can be uh, watershed hydrology modeling, can be economic modeling. We have recently uh, with uh, colleagues, uh, we worked on a paper where we looked at the different scenarios of land use change and economic consequences. And that's the, uh, I found it a very big challenge to match the level of detail you work on on different levels. So the kind of level of detail uh, we tend to work on, at least in my field, to match it in the level of detail that uh, watershed modelers and hydrologists, uh, hydrological modelers are working is, is very different. So a lot of stuff which is very essential in my field, uh, we want, uh, really the kind of questions we're really curious about and really excited about might not necessarily be the most relevant on the level of uh, hydrological modeling. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a process in which we are uh, in, in the current project as well. Not how do we match the kind of uh, questions uh, I would be interested in from the plant science to plant ecology science versus what is interesting from a part of a uh, point of view of hydrological modelers and designers, etc. I think we are, we are in the middle of that at the moment. And I find it a tremendously interesting uh, process. So uh, hopefully in a year or so, we can tell you much more about how it works out. Thank you kindly. Well, we are just about at the end of our hour. Are there any last thoughts from either the, the presenters? Nicola, from you or Adrienne, any last thoughts? Well, it is really going to be exciting. And for those of you who know the website, please do go and visit the research pages projects of, uh, I noticed at the end that there's not a link as far as I can tell between the FCL page and the TANA page. So we got to make sure that that gets on there too. That'll be great. So we're cinching everything up here and you guys will all see more from at the end in the months to come with this wonderful engagement platform. So thank you again for sticking with us. It was a great session. We'll look forward, please do share with your friends and we look forward, you'll join us next time, I hope. Thank you.